Back to My Garden, Episode 14. Welcome to Back to My Garden. Discover your passion for gardening. Here is Dave Ledoux. Oh, hi, it's David. I got a gardening tip of the week for you. Whether you're trying to grow bigger roses, orchids, or giant pumpkins, you need better soil. The best of the best use Haven brand Mupu Tea. What the heck is Mupu Tea? You need to know. Check it out at backtomygarden.com front slash moo. This episode of Back to My Garden brought to you by Coffee Royalty. Is it really possible to lose 5, 10, even 20 pounds or more just by switching your coffee or tea? Find out more at www.backtomygarden.com front slash coffee. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world when you listen to this. I'm Dave Ledoux, and welcome to another edition of Back to My Garden. And today we have an exciting guest joining us from Northeast Kansas. She loves organic gardening. She has beautiful gardening photography on her blog. And this season, she's growing a lot of Japanese vegetables, and we're going to be talking about that and other things today. And I want to welcome to the call Megan Phelps. Megan, welcome to Back to My Garden. Hi, how are you? Fantastic. Are you ready to dig in? Yeah. Fantastic. I want to get to know you a little bit, and I'm sure my listeners want to get to know you a little bit. Can you take a minute or two and just share with us a little bit about your background and a little bit about your garden? Um, Yeah, okay. So I have been gardening for about five years, um, about four years um, since I moved into this house, which is wonderful. Up until that point, I felt like I was gardening wherever I could in other people's yards for the most part. Um, I work in communications, and I have uh, done a lot of work recently with the Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Kansas, um, which is kind of how I got started with Japanese vegetables. Um, but I have a pretty wide range of gardening interests. So, um, yeah, where should we start? Well, I, I wanted to start with the fact that you were growing food in other people's yards. But we'll circle back to that. I love that okay. idea. Okay. All right. That sounds good. <laughs> I just have an image of you dressed like a ninja going around at night harvesting. <laughs> really, yeah, real gorilla gardening. Not quite that bad. Um, although it, it was mostly just persuasion, you know, to let other people for other people to let me use their yards. Now, you're in your fifth season of gardening. Uh, uh-huh. What's it been like? I mean, to, I assume you've uh, started gardening as an adult. Did you do it as a child? or Who, who introduced you? How did you catch the bug? Um, well, we did have, have uh, a garden when I was growing up. And I think at that point, um, most of my garden memories are really with my grandpa. And we would go out in his garden, and I really vividly remember digging for potatoes and just thinking that was the ma- most magical thing in the world because, of course, you can't see them until you dig them up. So that was really that was really cool. Um, and I feel like I've never really lost touch with gardening. Like, I remember my mom um, in college bringing me a cherry tomato plant for the, the balcony of my apartment. Um, and then since then, it was just all about finding a place where I could really garden, you know, from season to season and spread out and plant as much as I wanted to. Mm, the cherry tomato on the balcony. I mean, Right, I know. And herbs and pots, which I think a lot of people have done too, when you're desperate and you don't have any space. Well, I, a lot of our listeners are city dwellers way up in the big, tall apartments, and that is uh-huh. the extent of their garden. They've got a windowsill, they've got a balcony or a patio. Right. And, you know, they're making the best that they can with the space they have. So I guess... Everyone falls into two categories. Um, mm-hmm. I had the indentured servant child, six years old, picking potato bugs. Uh-huh. And yeah. then there's the people that find it in their 20, 20s, 30s, 40s, or later. Yeah, um, I, can, I can kind of relate to both camps. Um, I feel like I wasn't really able to start gardening until I was in my 30s. Um, I would have liked to start a little bit earlier, but... Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to talk to people who start gardening really young. Um, one of the, the cool things, you want to talk a little bit about the Garden Connect project? Yeah, let's transition into Garden Connect. We have a few listeners familiar with it. It's big on Twitter. Yeah. Tell, me what, tell me your experience with it. Well, one of the things that I was thinking about in this context is just that I feel like a lot of people involved with that are very young gardeners, um, which I like. I, I think it's so cool to see people who are you know just even like college age. Um, which I think the, the organizer is, Matt Hemstra. 
Um, and a lot of young gardeners and people who are really active on social media. Um, I'm 37, so I'm considerably older than a number of people in the group. Um, but I got started with it just because of um, when I when I started doing a garden blog, I got hooked in with social media and started interacting with a few other gardeners who, it turned out, um, almost everyone I connected with was in a different country, which I thought was wonderful, talking to people from Canada and Australia and the U.K., um, the Netherlands, which is interesting, um, the occasional American gardener. But I heard from um, um, Matt, again, the organizer of the Garden Connect Project, who's not somebody I'd ever met, but I knew was from Canada, and um, found out that there were all these other people who the idea is you follow um, – one basic plan, it's a very small garden bed, it's six foot by two foot, but everybody is is planting basically the same thing in a square foot um, garden design. And we're all garden bloggers, so we all write about it and kind of compare notes. And I just thought, wow, that's, that's the coolest thing because we're in all these different climates. Um, we have different situations with, you know, rain and short seasons and different varieties are going to work, you know, in different ways. And it just thought this is going to be really cool to see how it goes and see how other people have different experiences with something that's essentially the same plan. And so for 2014, uh, what is it mm-hmm. you're growing in your 6x2 for that project? Oh, let me pull up the actual plan so that I don't tell you the wrong thing. Um, there was It's very democratic. There was some debate about what should go in there, so that was kind of fun. That was, all happened on Facebook. Um, it's a, so the Garden Connect plan, it's um, it's 12 um, squares, essentially, that are a square foot each, and it's um, kale, parsnips, spinach, romaine lettuce. Uh, we decided on purple carrots, yellow onions, red beets, sweet peppers as opposed to hot peppers. Um, we decided to do specifically plum tomatoes, nasturtiums, bush beans, and um, lemon-type cucumbers. Fantastic. What is thriving in your garden this year on that project, and what is struggling? Is there anything you're mad at? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I couldn't get the nasturtium to come up at all, <laughs> so it's it's gone. Um, the kale is doing amazingly well. I've never grown kale before. Um, I've planted it, and it hasn't come up. Um, I don't know. I think maybe just something about the this particular year, the planting time or whatever, but it looks gorgeous right now. And then I think the... Um, tomato and the cucumber are competing to take over the entire square, nice. <laughs> the entire rectangular plot. Um, tomatoes are doing wonderfully here this year. My tomato plants are just really taking off. Um, I, I've had a lot of trouble with carrots historically. I have very heavy clay garden soil, and I have struggled with root vegetables of all kinds. And this is the first year it was like, okay, I'm finally... I'm, I'm really going to commit to this. I'm going to plant onions, carrots, beets. You know, they may not do well, but we'll just see how they do. Um, all of the carrots in the Garden Connect plant uh, plot have died. <laughs> and I think I got two beets. But uh, my onions did really well, actually. I have already harvested all of those and was, was pretty happy with those. For those of you driving in the car, please keep both hands on the wheel. Or if you're jogging, you can come back. I'll put the... Uh, Links in the show notes. Make sure you check out Megan on Twitter at Seeds Mulch Weeds. That's a brilliant Twitter, by the way. And her blog. You've got to subscribe and share her photos off her blog at www.seedsmulchweeds.com. What I love about your tone, Megan, is you have stuff die and you're okay with it. I'm still at the phase where I have emotional attachment to my garden. Yeah, I can can understand that. you know, it's always disappointing when things don't don't do well. But I think that's the wonderful thing about having a garden where you have so many different plants going all the time. Um, you know, it's sad when something doesn't do well, but it's just there's always something growing. Um, if bugs take out one entire crop, if they take out all the squash, <laughs> you know, if there's a disaster, tomato diseases and all the tomatoes die. And it's the beautiful thing about, you know, <laughs> biodiversity and crop diversity and and growing um, so many different kinds of things, there's usually something that's going to pull through. And for those of you playing the home game, jump on Twitter and you can follow along. Is it hashtag Garden Connect? Yep, that's right. 
I hope Matt does it again next year. I have a feeling this could become a global phenomenon. I know I definitely participate. It's it's really fun to see um, everybody else's blogs and, and photos, especially. Um, it's funny. I, so many people um, are better at weeding than I am. <laughs> I didn't some want to make a are... comment, but if you look at some of your photos. It's almost like you got a ground mulch or a cover. Uh, yeah, I, I have. Um, yeah, I mean, I I put I put weeds in the name of the the blog for a reason. I really am, am fairly lazy about weeding, and you know, and, and letting weeds live and go to seed in certain places i'm pretty relaxed about it um about a lot a lot more than a lot of people are but i think you can probably see also in some of my photos i have lots of leaves um i do a pretty heavy mulch in my front yard i have two enormous oak trees and i basically take the those leaves in the fall stockpile them sock them away and then pull them out through the year as needed so um I don't ever have quite enough, which seems sort of amazing because they're two enormous trees. And I'm also one of these people who um, will drive around and pick up other people's leaves off the curb (laughs) when they put out their garden waste to be collected. Um, With permission, you know, I I usually talk to to friends and, and, you know, scrounge some extra leaves. But um, it's amazing how gardens eat mulch. And you can use it to keep weeds down, and it's great for the soil, but especially when it's warm and in a wet year, it just it disappears so quickly. It's just it's constant, constant search to find enough to keep the ground covered. You know, I'm so happy with my own eyes because I looked at that and I said, I think those are oak leaves because I grew up kind of in the same they are, central yeah. part That's as you. Exactly I, grew right. up, I grew up in Manitoba, which giant oaks, uh-huh. and... That must just keep the moisture in and breaks down over the course of the summer and feeds your plants. It really works well, and you would think that they would blow all over the place. You would think that they would never stay in place. But they they really do pretty well, and I kind of wonder if oak leaves specifically are better just because the the edges, um, you know, are are rough enough that they all kind of stick together. I would think that if you had um, a leaf with rounder edges, like or a larger leaf that I've, I've seen those where the wind will pick it up and blow them. But it's crazy. On a windy day in the garden, you'd think that there would be leaves blowing everywhere, and they, they pretty much stay in place. This season, I really got excited about the nerdy science part of gardening as we bought the chemist- uh-huh. the chemistry set to test the soil. And our nitrogen levels were just ridiculous. Our pH is off the charts. I'm going, oh, no wonder we have problems in certain beds. Yeah. My wife is in university taking the master gardening course, and uh, it's just that's what I've been attracted to is this idea of, you know, your results will be dependent upon your soil and feeding the soil. Yeah, that that makes so much sense. I, I know that I should have my soil tested, and I have yet to get around to it. I keep meaning to do that every year, and then I get sucked into other things in the garden. Um, what I've heard, though, is that almost any type of soil will benefit from organic matter. Mm. And I am all organic. I don't do any sort of, you know, chemical fertilizers. So everything is organic matter. It's all slow release. Um, I think no matter what um, actual chemical composition the soil is, that's going to be a benefit. Um, but, yeah, just out of curiosity, I really would like to go and have it tested, so I need to get around to doing that. And actually the um, place you do that is, Maybe four or five blocks from where I live, <laughs> so I really have no excuse. But put it in your Google Calendar, and you'll hear a ding. Yeah, yeah, I know. I just need to need to make an appointment to go over there. I think you inspired a whole bunch of people by giving yourself permission to have weeds in your garden. Well, that's that's good to hear. Mm-hmm. I want to back up because you've you're in your new place and you've got this wonderful garden, but in the beginning years, three four years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, what was it like? What were some of the obstacles when you were just getting started? I would say the the heavy clay soil was was the biggest one, um, because I uh, I have actually had the experience of doing a little bit of of natural building stuff, and I know that you know you can make bricks out of um, the clay. And you hard sometimes if you find a really good clay concentration. And that's that's kind of where my garden soil was. I mean, you would pick it up and it would stick together. And it, I, you really could have made clay bricks with, with my garden soil. 
And um, I think it's made an enormous difference in the last few years adding organic material. Um, but yeah, at the beginning, it was kind of ridiculous trying to grow any sort of, even like a radish. Um, it just couldn't get down through the soil. It was, it was a big, um, um, it was a big limitation, I would say. Did you ever consider just calling it a day and packing it in or just that wasn't even an option? No, it was more a question of should I bring in compost on a larger scale? You know, like how much work am I going to have to do to make this work? Um, no, at that point I was pretty well hooked on gardening um, and was so excited about having space of my own to do it. Um, you know, the main thing was I <laughs> I went pretty crazy with the seed order that first year and had, you know, probably twice as much as I could actually plant. So, no, at that point I was so enthusiastic there was nothing that was going to slow me down. But I do have to say that the last year or two it's been significantly easier to grow things. Um, and something that I wish I'd done at the beginning was to bring in large quantities of compost. It would have made a huge difference. I really tried to do everything with mulch and... Um, Besides the leaves, one kind of organic matter I've added is brewing waste because my husband is a home brewer, and um, you end up with a lot of spent grain after after making beer, which is absolutely wonderful um, as far as an, an addition to the soil. I've put a ton of that in the garden, um, and it's, it's really exciting to look at the garden and actually see worms in there. <laughs> It feels like healthy, healthy living soil, and it's just it's so much lighter than it was even a couple of years ago. But um, I wish I'd brought in big quantities of compost at the beginning because um, I did in a small way, but this last year I finally broke down and got city compost. Um, I had been worried about it before because I've just I've read too much about um, compost that has high concentrations of pesticides, and so I've been pretty conservative about you know not getting free compost unless I knew exactly what was in it. And this year I just decided this is not worth it. I haven't heard of anyone within the last few years having any problems using just the plain city compost. So I added it, and it's made an enormous difference. Things just grow so much better. You have access to homemade beer plus basically natural compost. Yeah, yeah. It's... uh, um, it's kind of exciting, I think. I enjoy um, using what you have in the garden. I think that's kind of a fun challenge um, because it can be an expensive hobby, but I love that if you want to, you can do things really cheaply. Um, I, I love uh, using materials that are already around, like the leaves in my front yard for mulch rather than buying mulch. And I, I think it's really exciting when you talk to people who go to seed fairs and get most of their seeds that way. I haven't, I haven't done that quite as much. Um, but I, that aspect of gardening really appeals to me. Let's talk a little bit about that passion side of the gardening, because some people just do it for food, but mm-hmm. for some it's an emotional or almost spiritual replenishment or nourishment. What's gardening like for you in that element? Um, you know, I... I really like the practical side of gardening, and because of that, I grow almost entirely vegetables. I do have some um, perennial flowers, and, you know, I I appreciate them, but I don't get as excited about them in the same way. So I would say that, for me, um, gardening is is really practical, and it is stuff that I eat, and I I really love that part of it. But there is something that's just so beautiful about gardening. about plants. I am really hooked on plants, and I love going out into the garden and seeing what's going on, seeing what's new. I've also, um, I really didn't do a lot of photography before I started gardening, and for me, they've been sort of twin obsessions. (laughs) Like, my um, gardening feeds my photography habit and vice versa, because it's this whole little world out there. And I love seeing not just the plants, but also bugs, which it's, it's funny. I talk to people occasionally, like, in fact, my parents were saying, oh, I feel so bad. You know, you have all these bugs in your garden. You keep posting them on the, on your blog. And it's like, oh no, they're, you know, I I think it's so fascinating to see what the bugs are doing. Um, I realized that I'd maybe at one point last year gone a little bit too heavy with, um, talking about what was happening with different insects. But, um, you know, I just think all of those different interactions are fascinating. Um, what, 
you know, which bugs are, are eating each other, um, which ones are helping, which are the beneficials that are helping control pest populations. It's just, it's, I like, I like the science of it. We're uh, facing the bee crisis up here as well, like yeah. it's happening in the States and butterflies. And so yes. the, the dialogue to plant just sections of your garden to attract pollinators. Right. And, you know, discussing that all the time and trying to raise, raise awareness of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we had bees about two years ago and they all died. Um, we had two hives that, that collapsed. I, I think possibly because we were new beekeepers, not necessarily because of bee diseases, which I think is, is most of what's behind colony collapse, although there's obviously there's a lot of different research about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a real need for pollinators. Uh, we also have apple trees, which is why we were trying to keep a bee population going, and I think we'll probably have to beehives again at some point. Another big issue, especially around here, so um, I live very close to the University of Kansas, which is where Monarch Watch is located. And um, it's a, a wonderful place to be because every year they have um, a big plant sale and they do butterfly-friendly plants. And uh, we're all very aware around here of um, the problems that um, monarch butterflies are having um, with their migration routes and how important it is to plant milkweed um, to keep um, healthy monarch populations going. Um, and planting, uh, they have whole kits where they do monarch way stations. Is that something that is uh, familiar where you're at? I think we're right kind of at the center of it, actually, here in Kansas. Yeah, we're, we're nearing the top end of their range, so we do have yeah. monarchs, but nothing like the quantities uh, where you were. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's really wonderful to have them, and I just I think they're amazing and beautiful, but it is... It is scary how much they need milkweed. So anyway, we planted some milkweed this year. I've had a hard time getting it to grow, but it's encouraging to talk to other gardeners in the area and realize how many of them are doing butterfly gardens, how many are planting milkweed. Um, looking around town and seeing people with plant milkweed on their on their bumpers of their cars. So, um, yeah, pollination is and dying pollinators is, is a scary thing. Um, I, dealing with... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, no, go ahead. finish your thought. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, watching things change so quickly um, with butterflies and thinking, you know, there could be a point where there aren't any more monarchs is just so sad. So anything you can do to help support bee populations and support um, populations of monarch butterflies, I think, is, is positive, especially the garden. Well, let's transition into your garden. So. Th- now this season, what are you growing a lot of? What are you experimenting with? Is there anything that's uh, thriving and what's bugging you? Well, what I'm experimenting with um, that's that's totally new to me this year is I've been planting um, more um, Asian vegetables, which is kind of fun. Um, and that's something I started because of working at the Center for East Asian Studies. I actually work with a lot of gardeners, which is cool and people who know a lot about the different plants and how they're used in cooking and that kind of thing. So um, that's, that's been really fun. Um, it's, it's exciting to see plants that are kind of familiar and yet are used totally differently, you know, different culinary uses. So I, um, I just posted pictures of um, the giant cucumbers that I'm growing, um, which I, I wrote this down so I'd have the variety name handy. It's Nippon Senjuki Kiri. And I guess that translates to something like three-foot Japanese cucumber. Um, but mine are not actually three feet. They're only about one foot at the moment. Um, so I kind of, I, I've heard that they're better if they're harvested earlier, but I sort of want to let them grow just to see how big they get. Um, another favorite crop is, um, I really like pole beans in general. I think green beans are just, you know, they're so versatile. It's easy to take them and eat a lot of them. Um, but I think that pole beans are so pretty when you take a trellis and are growing any kind of beans. Um, but I've been growing Chinese long beans or um, yard long beans. There are several different names for them. And I, I think they're the coolest plant. Um, they have beautiful purple blossoms. They get, not again, not quite a yard long, but they are seriously long, narrow beans. And what's really fascinating to me is that the ants love them. Um, there are... I grew them last year, too, um, so those aren't a completely new thing to me. But um, 
I've taken so many pictures, it's kind of ridiculous. But I love going out and seeing what the ants are doing on the beans because they don't seem to be hurting anything. And I haven't actually seen any aphids because I've heard that ants will farm aphids. Um, so they're, you know, even if they're not directly a pest insect, they can be problematic. But I think, I think they're just crawling all over the flowers and getting the nectar. Um, it's just, it's really interesting to see ants crawling on these really, really long beans. It's uh, it's kind of a fun thing to watch. Tell me you've tasted the Japanese cucumber. I did, and the first one I had was really bitter. And I don't think I don't think it's the problem with the cucumber. I think you know, I mean, some cucumbers just end up being bitter. I don't think it's the particular variety. Um, I'm crossing my fingers for the next one. So hopefully, hopefully that one is a little bit better. Um, the photo I, on your blog, I, uh, you have a trellis, a white trellis? Yeah, I have. Um, they're actually their kitchen shelves. I'm <laughs> sort of waiting for my mom to call me at some point and say, wait, I gave you those shelves. Why are you using them in the garden? <laughs> They've been promoted but, and repurposed. I know. It's, I think, you know, the, the highest possible use for them. They are, you know, doing a wonderful job of supporting cucumbers. Um, but, yeah, it, they... Um, the long cucumbers do really need a trellis because you can really tell the difference. Um, they coil around themselves unless they have room to hang straight. So I keep rearranging the um, shelving so that they have room, you know, to kind of stretch out and it keeps them um, growing straight as opposed to curving around. Make sure you uh, listeners head over to Megan's blog at www.seedsmulchweeds.com. That's the photography element, so photo so photograph heavy really good photos when you see the japanese cucumber you know i know my wife's going to want to find some seeds for next year i don't know we're in zone like four or five we get the weather off the great lakes so i think we could do pretty well with it yeah we're in uh 6a here so a little bit different but really these grow very fast Mm -hmm. um i'm looking I, i i got the seed packets out um it's 60 to 75 days to maturity so not are, bad. are you getting that crazy drought, or is it not too bad this year? I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, the crazy drought, like in the Midwest. You're getting rain, though, right? Oh, yeah. We've actually gotten quite a bit of rain this year. Um, I, keep, I keep hearing that historically, um, we're, I mean, we're still down. Um, like, we haven't gotten enough rain to make up for the drought, but I have to say that as far as, as the garden, it feels like things have been wet. I've been worried more about... Um, garden diseases because of too much rain as opposed to um, um, not getting enough water. But yeah, I think if, I think talking to to farmers, uh, they're still worried about drought. Hmm. You know, our half hour is rapidly escaping us and now is my favorite time in the show when we get to play the game called Five Quick Questions. Okay. This is where you get to share your wisdom and experience with our listeners. Are you ready to play? Okay. Okay. Question number one, in your opinion, What do you think stops most people from starting their first garden? I think often it's space. It's not having a place to garden. Um, Or not having sufficient sun. Uh, And sometimes I think, unfortunately, being in a beautiful neighborhood with big trees is kind of a mixed blessing because sometimes you just don't have enough sunny space. And I I think for a lot of my friends that's an issue. Mm -hmm. Question number two. What is the best gardening advice that you've ever received? I can't remember where I heard this the first time, but I've heard it a number of times, and that's that there's, there's a learning curve. And that um, I, think, I find that to be incredibly reassuring. Um, even after five years, I feel like I, I'm not quite a beginning gardener and maybe an advanced beginner at this point, but that you learn so much as you go along. And, you know, I talk to people with much more experienced people have been gardening for 30 or 40 years and i feel like there's still things that they're learning you know tweaks that they're making uh different ways you can experiment it's just it's it's a process and i think that's a lot of fun excellent number three if you had just two websites to share with a beginning gardener what would those websites be um it's really hard to pick just two (laughs) But if I can say, just kind of as a category, um, I think extension websites are amazing. I use them all the time. Um, and in fact, 
um, I don't I don't know if there um, is an equivalent for a lot of people internationally, but in the United States, it's the state extension offices. It's through your county extension. Um, all of the extension publications are just wonderful. And I usually will just go on Google and I'll search for something like um, squash bugs has been on my mind recently. And I'll, I'll search um, the term extension along with it. And you just get such great published information. And then another one I have to, that I go back to again and again, I would have to say, is um, um, Mother Earth News and MotherEarthNews.com is the website version of that. I worked there for a number of years. I've read so many of the articles, and they have very, very, very deep archives for organic gardening. It's just an amazing source. Excellent. MotherEarthNews.com. Well, question number four. I'm an enthusiastic amateur. I'm in my third summer of gardening. My wife's you know, year 16. Uh-huh. Can you recommend one book that I should read about gardening this year? Um, my favorite gardening book is not really a how-to book, which I, I feel like maybe it should be. But I really like reading people's just stories and essays and experiences about gardening. And my absolute favorite is Michael Pollan's book, Second Nature. Um, it's it's just so funny and I feel like when I read it I learn a lot but it's just it, it also is just a lot of fun and just stories about what it's actually like to be a gardener and things that you encounter it's it's terrific Second Nature by Michael Michael Pollan, Pollan. Okay. Uh, the same guy who did Botany of Desire and F- Food Rules um, this is one of his earlier books and I don't think it's nearly as well known but it's all about gardening and it's wonderful love it that's a resource right there, folks. Listen to that. Excellent. The other day, a gentleman recommended I read a 930-page gardening book, and I just, I gulped. It's yeah, I suspect that this one will be more fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, question number five. Look into your crystal ball. Prediction time. What's the number one thing that every gardener should try to grow next year? Oh, well, I want to say tomatoes just because tomatoes are the most wonderful homegrown thing in the garden. But just step away from that a little bit because I think everybody who gardens thinks about tomatoes first. I have to say that green beans are just my favorite thing to grow. Um, and I think you can grow them pretty much anywhere. I could I could be wrong, but I just think you can't go wrong by growing green beans. And especially um, pole beans that you grow on a trellis. They're easy, they're pretty, they fit in a small space. They're just cool. Fantastic. Our time is vanishing. I want all our listeners to head over to Megan's blog at www.seedsmulchweeds.com. Follow Megan on Twitter and share her awesome photos at Seeds Mulch Weeds. Check out uh, hashtag Garden Connect. Check out the photos and... Uh, Next year, we'll all participate together, help grow that around the earth. Uh, Megan, I'm going to give you the last word today. Do you have a word of wisdom or a note of encouragement for our listeners? Um, I think just if you are interested in gardening and you you know, are, are not quite ready to take the plunge, I, I just think you should go for it. Get out there and garden. Fantastic. Megan, thanks so much for being on Back to My Garden. Okay. Thank you very much. This has been fun. Special thanks to Megan Phelps. Excellent. All of the show notes, links, and resources will be up at www.backtomygarden.com front slash 14. Hello, garden lover. Do you want to save time, save money, and have your most amazing garden ever? Receive free tips, strategies, and gardening techniques from passionate gardeners from around the world. Join the VIP club for free today at backtomygarden.com front slash VIP. Uh-huh.